Hi everyone, we, uh, I'm Andrea and this is my colleague Nina, we're from Baja Secondary and we are the last presentation of the day, so hope you'll bear with us for a while when we present this. So, our project that we're presenting today is called Supplementing Fieldwork in the Immersive Learning Environment. And, firstly, what is the Immersive Learning Environment? Uh, as you can see here, this is a picture of the world we've been working in. And some of you might actually know this as by its other name, which is Second Life. Has anyone heard of it before? Uh, for most of you who don't know, Second Life is um, it's sort of like an online environment. So if you've seen things like um, you know online games, League of Legends, and all these MMORPGs, it's something a little bit like that. So what happens is that this virtual world is on a server and we can access it through our school laptops once we install a particular program. So the kids, they can log in from any school laptop that we have the program installed on. In fact, if they wanted to, they could actually download the program themselves and access it from home. So what happens is that when they enter this world, they are represented by avatars, those little characters that they create for themselves, and they can go in and explore the world. Now, the thing about this world is that it can, it can be customised. And for this project, we worked with uh, NIE's uh, research, research Education Branch. Yes, Research Education Branch. And they were the ones that actually created the world. So we're just borrowing it off them. And in the process, they've actually helped us a lot. If you can see here, this is a aerial view of the area that we use. It's known as Tomasic, and this is Tomasic North. There's actually another area below Tomasic South, but we didn't use it for this particular project. And they also have areas that can be totally fully customized by the students. So geography teachers, you can tell there's quite a few um, geographical landforms, but I'm sure everyone can see there's a river, there are coasts, and there is actually a mountain range right through the middle. So while we're working on this, uh, NIE helped us a lot in getting a customized environment that we could work with. So the reason why we are using this, we like to emphasize this, is that this is not this is not a replacement for the geographical field work. This is a supplement to it. So we do it together with our field work. Last year when we carried out field work with our first, uh, our second batch of students, we realized that the problem with when we take our students out onto the field is that they actually don't concentrate on the field. What they concentrate on is using the instruments. They get so caught up in doing everything right, the process of the instrument itself, that they lose the entire process of field work. So what we did was, together with NIE, we created this lesson package which they carried out over two, two sessions after school and one session in class for them to actually experience the entire flow of the fieldwork process. And second thing, as we all know Singapore, our weather is limited to hot, very hot, incredibly hot and monsoon periods. So unfortunately, the textbook isn't just about monsoon and tropical, we also have other climates like temperate, you know, our snow. So, in Singapore, we don't have much physical features as well. We have uh, we have a hill which is pretending to be a mountain called Mount Faber, and that's about all we have. So, what we wanted was to give students a chance to look at more diverse environments and also more diverse weather data, which we managed to through the use of the immersive learning environment. Okay, so our main goal here is firstly the basics, which is to get the students to learn their. Few works, uh, there are few work skills, observing, sketching, collecting, analyzing of data, and more importantly, we want them to actually view whatever environment they are in through a geographical lens. For those of you who were here earlier for Dr. Kenneth Lim's um, keynote speaker, he was the main person that we were working with on this project. We want to bring up what we call the student's geographical intuition, which is you know they are sort of six sense. Like when you look at environment, you can go, oh, it's very hot because the sun is shining, there's no clouds. Of thing. So, and most importantly for our particular, for our students, our we did this with our four A batch. They are very active, very very what you call on students. But because they're very active, they need to move. They are not the kind that can sit down listen to the lecture. They must be doing something. So they learn best when we engage them, when we actually make them do, when we make them experience. So for them, this was a very fun and interactive way to learn. Okay. So earlier, Dr. Kenner did share this the six learning framework, out of which three of them we have incorporated in our project. Learning by exploring, where the students go in, have their avatar, go around the world, and then collaborating. We put them in groups of about three, four, they shared one laptop, and they went to explore the world. On top of that, they also shared data with each other at the end of it, and collated the data. And most importantly, learning by being. The 
think about uh, the immersive learning environment, it's sort of like a fuel in itself. Because the students are in the environment itself, they actually can look at it. And this environment is quite special because it has this camera function. We can look up, down, left, right. And the best part is, you can look at it from any view. On view, when you're doing view, you're standing here, all you can see is, I see a tree. And you can't tell the tree is higher or lower than you. But in the immersive learning environment, you can actually fly like Superman up into the sky. You can have an aerial view, you can have a bottom-up view, you can have any view you want. So, we constructed this uh, lesson plan, lesson package based on these four steps. We cut, uh, I say cut down, we broke up the viewer process into these four main things, which is having the hypothesis, conducting the experiment, analyzing results and conclusion. So, we have another one at the top, over there, let's explore. We gave them some time to look at the virtual world, the immersive learning environment. From there, they investigated, looked at their hypothesis, collected data within the immersive learning environment itself, and finally analyzed the data to draw conclusions. So, next my colleague Nina should be taking you through the actual project itself and what we did. So the first task for the student is that they are supposed to explore the world. Because we know when the students log into the world, they are super excited because now they can fly. Now, instead of, and they learn to fly rather than walking and riding. So we say, okay, why not explore the island but with a purpose? So what happened is around this Tamasic door, there is uh, a few weather stations. There's six all together. But we wanted to locate four. So when they locate these four weather stations, what they need to do is more than just locating. They have to look at the environment and try to describe where these weather stations are located. Is it at the top of the mountain, uh, mid cliff, for example? Is it near the beach? Or is it at a, near a water body? Things like that. So the kids are very excited. They fly around, they explore, and then they jot down what they see. So from there, we ask them to rank these places from the hottest to the coolest based on their observation. What, who, which place they think is the hottest and which place uh, they think is the coolest place on the location. So after they explore, at the end of the day, we wanted them to take home, digest what they have seen and explore and come up with a hypothesis as to why this place is hot or why this place is uh, cool. And then that brings us to task two, which is uh, uh, task three, sorry, which is the next day when they come back, we want them to investigate how true their hypothesis is. So we want them to gather data. I mean, there are four weather stations, and because of time constraint, we told the students that okay, you can only explore two, or you're going to gather data from two weather stations. So what they did is they need to take two readings. Okay, things like temperature, relative humidity, uh, air pressure, cloud cover. Okay, these are the standards. Okay, so they will go to the first weather station and then they fly to the second one for their, the first reading and then come back again to the first, day, uh, first station and, and then collect the second readings before calculating the average. But more importantly, because we want to have that sense, we want to bring out the geographical intuitions, we, we get the kids to actually draw, sketch the landscape to see how the location and the weather processes can affect their weather reading. So from there, they come back uh, to the class with data collect collected. I mean, ideally, we want them to collect all the data that their classmates have gathered. But because of time constraint, we just piece all this data together and we show it to them. And we ask them, okay, look at this data. Uh, what type of data representation method would you choose to represent all this data in relation to your hypothesis and why? So they will think about it. Then after they piece all this information together and decide on their data representation method, they will look at whether, you know, look at the patterns and see whether this data actually support their hypothesis or not. Yes, why, no, why? And then of course, the last step is to really reflect on what are the things that they could have done better, what are the things that could have actually affected the validity of their whole investigation. So, by doing all this, they will have completed the entire geographical investigation. So, this is what we do in class. You can see the students, they are in groups of three, and then they are in the virtual world, we model for them, and the kids actually pick up very fast when it comes to this kind of gaming. They, are, they know how to fly, walk, use the cameras pretty quickly actually. So, quick, uh, and this is actually for our 4A student. So, this is when they are, they are logging in, you can uh, look at it again. So, the idea is that by allowing them to explore the environment and giving them that kind of freedom, they enjoy it, but at the same time, they are more attuned to the environment and that they have that sense of heightened awareness about the 
landscape that they are in and that is what we wanted because ultimately it's all about how these processes may affect the relationships between all these data variable. Okay, that's what we want our students to do. So these are some of the samples of students' work, like their hypotheses and why, like for example, uh, site A is the hottest because it is it is an open area and things like that. Okay, then these are the sketches. Uh, what we wanted to emphasize is that not only just to draw but to really annotate. And of course we tell the kids that when you are going to draw, where do you stand? How do you position your camera angle to show that these are the processes that have that is happening in that landscape that can affect your weather data. Okay. So these are the things that they I mean the standard uh, data reading things that they, that they will have already. I mean for this for this uh, project, it's, more, it's not so much a data collection, but it's just really gathering the data and analyzing and being aware of the processes. That's the key idea that we want our kids to get. Because we feel that they're very good at the data collection method already, the hands-on part. Okay, then what are the learning outcomes? I'll get my colleague to speak. Okay, so from a lot of this were our observations when we carry this out. For the first thing, we, for the first time in a very long time, we actually realized that all our students who were involved, they were all very involved in the environment. We actually had the entire class all seated, staring at the computer screens. Nobody was walking around, no one was running. And what I would say um, amazed us a bit was the fact that they were actually very, very efficient when carrying this out. Possibly because we um, sort of bribed them, telling them to finish early, we'll give you time to play. So we, what we did was we broke up the lesson, each step, we, we give them literally step by step. We give instructions for every step and we time them. We give about five to ten minutes. And they were actually some of the groups, almost all the groups were on task. And what was really amazing was some of them were actually faster than us. They will collect from site one. And while everyone is still at site one, they really have gone to site two. When we walked around, we saw this group, we were like, why are you not doing anything? And then they show us their completed worksheets. And we and me and Miss Lino like, Because they, I think it's something very new, very novel for them. They find it very exciting, and they actually grasp it surprisingly well. Because you know, IT, this uh, IT um, of the IT savvy generation, and surprisingly, you would think the boys are will pick this up very fast because gamers, but no, the girls are actually very good at this too. So what we really like in terms of what they learn in the end was we realized that in this particular environment, they actually are more focused in the sense that if you know drama teachers, you notice that you take your students out for the work, you realize they get distracted very easily. What they're supposed to do, you have to keep telling them to come back, come back a lot of times to what you're supposed to be doing. Like they, you know, they will see like, oh, somebody will pass, then they'll get distracted. But in this environment, because there's nothing else to distract them other than themselves, they actually focus more on what they see. For example, when we took our students out to botanic gardens, it took a lot of prompting for them to see that site A and site B had different temperature readings because of things like ground covering, presence of water. But the moment they entered this environment, they asked us things like, Sure, how come site A, the ground here is brown color, but site B, the ground is green? So these things are things that normally in real life they wouldn't pick up as quickly, but they actually picked up very fast in this environment. And also, we, uh, let's see, so, another thing is that by the end of it, we were also very pleasantly surprised by how much they retained. What we did was we had two sessions. We had the first session where they explored, second session where they collected data. And one week later, we came back to them in class to analyze the data. And while we were analyzing and we were asking them, oh, why do you think you had these kind of readings? They could actually tell us from memory that, oh, I remember this site had, was very high and this site was very low, maybe that's why. So they actually retained what they, a lot of what they did during the process, I think because they actually did it, they experienced. And most importantly was that because all this they did in a very compressed amount of time, they could actually remember the entire flow from having the hypothesis to the collecting of the data and everything. Because we find that you know we do new work, we do everything in class. Then we go out, we collect data, we come back. So students have this problem, they tend to view collecting data as a thing in itself which is quite problematic for us sometimes because they remember collecting data then they'll forget everything before and after. And with this immersive learning project, you could see everything as one big hole. And in this collaboration, we were very lucky. We got a lot of help from NIE, from Dr. Kenneth Lim and his team. So they were the ones that enabled us to be able to use this immersive learning environment. So we are hoping that in our future, 
in our future collaborations with them, maybe we can look at the possibility of incorporating more things. Because this project, uh, we did it on quite, it wasn't a very big scale, so we looked at very simple things like temperature, humidity, but hopefully this time we can explore things such as snow, which Singapore doesn't have. And the thing that is really amazing is that once the kids actually pick up the basics of how to explore the world, you can actually use the world and do a lot of other things. From what we understand from Dr. Lim, um, other schools do it for other subjects, not just geography. They use it for uh, history, literature, science also. Was it science? Yes. So, the th this is um, it's a platform that enables a lot of things to happen, not just geography. And other schools also have used it in many other different ways. But for us today, this is what we have to share with you. So, we would like to thank the NIE, NIE for their help to make this possible. And thank you for your attention. Uh, and please, any questions? Uh, any questions? No? Well, uh, the, the NIE team is still at the back, so if you're interested in uh, approaching them.